Hey everybody, happy Mother's Day. Welcome to this special edition of Quest for Peace. And because it's Mother's Day, we've decided to not interview any mothers on this show today because I didn't think this out very well. So uh, what I've done is I've harassed my friend Brian Brushwood to be on. If you don't know anything about him, well, we'll get to him in just a second. If you know anything about this show, this is all about trying to figure out inner peace and happiness. I've been trying to figure this out for years. I am not there yet. I've had uh, a crappy weekend at times. I've had a really good day yesterday and then had a lousy morning, but I'm still trying to figure out how to be happy because sometimes it's about growth and everything. So on this show, what I do is I share my continuous failures and I try to find out what my friends are doing or whoever's on the show, what the heck they do to be happy. And today we've got Brian Brushwood on. Brian, if people don't know who the heck you are, could you explain yourself to the human beings? Yeah, I'm I'm a uh, recovering stage magician turned uh, podcaster of all things. I uh, tour with a bizarre magic show, eating fire, shoving nails at my eyes, breaking bricks over my head. And then I started doing Scam School, which is all about how to win free drinks at the bar. Then we started doing a comedy show with Justin Robert Young called Night Attack and a, a show and, uh, called Court Killers with Tom, Tom Merritt. Yes. So, so you have what is a very strange life, it sounds like. Uh, what? What did you do in your, like, I almost want to say it's like a slave life. What did you do before you decided to go, the heck with this, I'm going to do magic, I'm going to be a performer? Because on this program, a lot of the discussion is basically people living in ruts and deciding, hey, I can break free, I can do more. What did you do before and how did you decide, oh, hey? this is a good question. Yeah. No, this, uh, and actually it's a timely question too because 15 years ago this month, May of 1999, I made the decision in my heart to uh, that I was going to quit my day job at Dell uh, doing uh, inside sales support. You know, Dell trains all of their sales reps to do, you know, everything about Dell systems. But I was part of like an elite team. I'm using air quotes for the audio listeners of people who were familiar with other systems. So somebody would call up and say, hey, I'm building an ISP. I need to know what kind of routers I should get. They would They would escalate them over to our group. And as far as like working for the man. It was a pretty good gig uh, in that, you know, we got lots of toys to play with. And, and, but, but what happened was, is I got a raise and the raise scared the crap out of me because I was working all week and it was all right. I mean, you could do worse than, than, you know, be on a decent track to make some money in the corporate world. But I always lived for that one night a week I would perform magic. And I never wanted, I never wanted to be that, 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 that hollowed out bastard who never actually pursued his dreams. So when I got a raise, it scared me and I realized this is how you get trapped doing something that you grow to hate for the rest of your life is the money just gets too good to walk away. So as a direct result, I was like, I'm going to take a year off, try this crazy magic thing. I'm, I'm going to get it out of my system and I'll probably come back in a year. And they're all like, well, see you in a year, Brushwood. Uh, but it ended up being obviously one of the best decisions of my entire life. Well, there had to be a lot of fear in that decision and the potential uh this chaos voice this is the, this term scott johnson mentioned on this show once and i can't let go of it this idea this little voice in your head saying there's this is a bad idea you shouldn't be doing this you could be doing more you've got responsibilities how did you quelch that voice to go you know what i'm going to do this given my all because if i don't try i'm going to hate myself for it part of part of it was a, a lucky artifact of time the fact that we just didn't happen to have any kids yet the fact that we were only what two years into our marriage, and you know, even though we weren't making much money, like both of us were working, so we were able to pay all the bills and have some money left over. So the idea of quitting, and partly it was because I had been doing enough work on the side, doing magic shows here and there, that I was like, oh no, I could see a world in which I could make as much money doing magic for a living as I did working at Dell. And keep in mind, like to me. That, that chaos vo voice got overshadowed by the voice that was screaming, you work in a cubicle. The, the, the phone line goes red when the queue's too long and you get excited about your bathroom breaks. This is clearly not what you were meant to do. Your natural gifts don't support you doing this. Uh, and so I, 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 didn't, I didn't have much of a sense of the penalty at the time. You know, whereas now I would say, I would say really the second time I quit my day job was like three years ago when all of a sudden I, I realized that uh, that I was letting go of my touring stage show because 
Uh, and that was a very different position because, you know, podcasting is still very new. Nobody knows really what we're doing. We're all feeling out different revenue models and, and, and ways to reach the most people. But when, when I decided to start investing all this time in scam school and night attack and cord killers, it was in a place where I had two kids working on a third and, and I had an established circuit of college shows that I could do. I mean, I was doing, I was doing a hundred to 150 college shows uh, a year. Uh, I, I headlined three years at universal Halloween horror nights. It was all about this stage show, but I realized that I was maxing out the number of people I could reach by in my stage show. I could only reach 300 to a thousand people. And then two weeks later they would forget that they ever even saw me. And I, and, and, that's the reason I sort of, and again, it's all Bonnie. Bonnie supported me the first time saying, you got one year, uh, see if this magic thing works. And I said, Bonnie, we've got to, we've got to try doubling down. I'm going to build up the studio and make it pretty. I'm going to invest in equipment and all this stuff. I'm going to see if it's possible for us to create revenue streams that have nothing to do with me running out, being on the road all over the country. And, you know, we're far from having everything settled, but but it seems to be working so far. And, in, and I would say in both regards, having somebody who believes in me and trusts in me and is there to support me was far and away the, the biggest thing that made it possible. It definitely quieted that chaos voice. So figuring that you're a performer, uh, you probably have a drive to improve each time you perform, whatever you're doing, whether it's a show, whether it's doing a podcast, just, just doing whatever the heck it is. How do you balance trying to improve and basically telling yourself, look, I'm not happy with what I'm doing. I can, I can do better. How do you balance that with actually being content? That's a really good question. I would say part of it is to find peace in your failures. It is never fun to have something go wrong and to end up losing and to realize you wasted your time. You made a fool your net brand value is now negatively impacted. You're worse off now than you were when you started. But if you can not wallow in that, if you can fail and say to yourself and believe it, this is an important step in the journey to getting to where I want to be, I feel like, like there's no penalty at that point. I mean, half the people never try anything because they're so afraid to fail. But if you can find peace in the failure, if you can say, what is the lesson? If you can tell yourself in the story of my life, this is an important failure that taught me some kind of lesson in order to make my next success possible. What lesson did I learn from this failure? If you can pull yourself out of that moment, I mean, you're sort of invincible at that point, right? Because when, when you're, when you're unafraid to fall, then you know. Then you could fly. I put that on a freaking T-shirt in like a Comic Sans script and put Brian's quote on there. That's the next thing coming. We don't usually call, you know ask the audience to make T-shirts, but I think this might be the first time we'll do that. <laughs> so you're basically talking about having the perspective to handle failures, I and mean, we we talked about failures a lot on this program, and it is a huge uh, thing to learn from. I, you know me pretty well. I get really freaking intense, and sometimes I cannot take myself out of that moment because I am just so fired up. Let's say I've had a really rough week, and I've given everything I've got. Uh, there's this idea that willpower is a finite resource. You know, if you don't recharge it, you're not going to have more of it. It goes away. And all week, and this is the truth. All week, I've had a pretty rough week. Some stupid stuff's been going on in my life, and I'm like, look, I'm going to handle this, and I will handle it with 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 a smile on my face. And then after that week was over, I had nothing left. How the hell do you find perspective when you're in the middle of basically, potentially, a rage quit? Man, that's another really good one. And especially since so often, and I'm sure it's the same for you, so often by the time you realize that, uh, I think they call it ego depletion, that idea that you only have so much willpower and then you crumble. By the time you realize that you're running out of, of willpower, it's almost too late. Like you're you're in the trench, like, like this has been decided. This is what you are working for. And I think, I think at that point you, you have to look at the machinery kind of model and say, uh, what I'm doing is untenable. I can't keep going. I don't, I clearly am out of gas or whatever. And so you start prioritizing, or at least what I do, what I will try to do is I will look at my schedule. The easy thing to do, let me, let me back up. The easy thing to do, and I think the trap a lot of people fall into, 
is borrowing credit from other institutions. You basically have uh, only only three things. You have you have your health. You have your money and you have your relationships, right? The uh, best moment I ever saw in a lecture was Brian Tracy says, write down three goals. Let me guess. One's about your health. One's about your relationships. One's about your finances. Uh, and people tend to usually pull credit out of, out of the relationship category. So if, say, if, if you are ego depleted and you come home angry and upset and you had a crappy day at work or whatever, usually we assume that whether it's your wife, your family, your relationship, your significant other, or, 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 or friendships even, we sort of assume that these are uh, undepletable wells. But those relationships have their own account balances as well. And it's easy to just sort of blow stuff off against them. And then all of a sudden you're, you, you run out and then you get divorced or something bad happens and you know your loved ones are upset with you. So I think it's important to realize the, 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 you have a set budget of emotional willpower. The support has to come from somewhere and you got to decide where to spend it uh, or, or where to collect it from. And it may be, it may be that you just got back from Hawaii and your wife really does, you know, just says, no, sure. I understand it's hard for you right now and I'm doing great, whatever. Uh, in that case, if you're gonna, if you are planning to deplete a resource, whether it's a work resource or whatever, figure out where it's going to come from. For example, I'm, there have been times that, that we plan to launch a product and release an episode and do this interview and fly out and do this show. And I realize I can't do all these things. And even though it's going to really screw up plans and this would have been the best time to launch the product, I got to say it, it can't happen unless you could figure out a way to, to do it without me, uh, because I only have so many hours or whatever. Um, I, I, I guess my advice is, and again, I don't know, you know, I'm just like you, I'm figuring all this out for the first time, is make cuts with eyes open. Don't be that guy that just blows up and, and doesn't know why, you know, it's um, instead, instead figure out like, you know, my tank is low in advance and figure out where you're going to take, uh, where you're going to refill it. And for me, it's been lately uh, yeah, you know, I'm certainly one to talk because, you know, two weeks ago, Justin and I had an on air full on argument fight that derailed our whole episode that uh, changed our plans. We had to figure out stuff. And I was really upset and bummed by it. And for me, I knew I needed to to find a place, you know, to to, to find peace, but also have it be a positive channeling for it. And so for like the next 10 days, man, I rode, I rode my bike uh, easily 200 and 250 miles during that time, talking two to three hours a day every day because during that time I knew I could, I could offer myself introspection and, uh, and end up, you know, even if I didn't solve any problems, at least end up going home with a net health positive even if I wasted a bunch of time and didn't get a bunch of work done. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just, it just reminds me how how I was telling my my week was pretty rough, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a lunch story. This this yeah. show goes all so what the heck. Uh, I was I uh, I came back from from uh, an appointment I had. I wanted to get some lunch. I stop off at a local place around work in San Francisco. Uh, I put my order in, and I wait and watch two people behind me order. It's it's not a fast food place so much as it's like I think something like Boston Market. I don't know if there's an equivalent to that kind of thing, but they have food and they're making it and they're making it fresh for you. So I ordered like a chicken dish. And the guy behind me orders a chicken dish. And the guy behind him orders a chicken dish. These two people get served before I do in the span of 20 minutes, which drove me incredibly upset because I'm looking at this stupid little puck. They give you a little puck with the lights go on, you know? And I'm like, it has a number 21 on it. And I just wanted, I wanted to actually have a scene. So I just, I took the little puck and I put it on the table and said, what's going on? These two people got served before I did. And the people just look at me like, uh, we don't know where your food is. I just walked out without lunch because what I had realized was I was keeping myself together for everything else. And this was like the last thing that set me off. Cause it's like when I'm hungry, I'm a cranky bastard. Everyone knows this. And when I not served lunch, that was like the first time I've actually cracked in public. Normally when that kind of stuff happens, I'm like, eh, you know what? I can wait. This isn't a big deal. Never mind the fact I'm borrowing time from work to wait at lunch at a place that should be serving much faster. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter, you say, why don't don't go to Ovo? That's why. Uh, go, go ahead, Brian. 
Well, I was I was going to say, I mean, in, on the one hand, you at least did a good thing in that you removed yourself from the situation, right? I mean, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, granted, you stormed off, uh, which I'm sure was frustrating, but at least you didn't blow up and start screaming and do stuff that would have that 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 would really give you a guilt trip later, right? Yeah, that that's definitely that that is my blow up now. It's like one phrase, get out, because putting myself there, I didn't want to be the guy on Twitter who was taking photos of. There's a, there's a whole lot of consequences, especially in San Francisco. Everyone's super connected around there anyway, let alone the real world is the same kind of thing. I didn't want to be in that kind of situation. You know that, that test, the, uh, the gravestone test? Don't do anything you wouldn't want on your gravestone or on the paper. I haven't heard that, but I like that. That's a good one. It's like, yeah. So it kind of reins me in sometimes, but I was realizing that with my current job, uh, which I really do like. Right now, I'm in process of moving to New York. My commute, a lot of the stuff I'm doing per day, before my job and after my job, I don't really get a say in it. I have to wake up at 5 in the morning. I have to get on the bus by 6.30. And i got to get in. That's not a problem. The work itself is great. Then after that, I have to rush to the bus and I get back. So I'm losing a lot of that free will I used to have, which is one of the bigger reasons I've moved. Um, I'm, I'm moving soon. So I've been really stressed uh, well, you know, that's that's more. part of uh, I, I wish I could remember which book it was, but there there was a study done on how satisfied people are with their work. And one of the factors they put in there, certainly pay was a factor, certainly uh, whether or not, um, you know, you, you, you were doing something that you felt like you were meant to do. Uh, but but there was a big part of whether or not you had autonomy in your job, you know, your happiness in your in your work was in many ways dependent on your autonomy. If you were trusted to handle things, people tended to like their jobs more. And there have been other studies that say, uh, for example, they they paid people, we'll say ten dollars an hour to dig a ditch for four hours, and then uh, and then they say now fill it back in, and uh, and then they spent four hours filling the, the the ditch back in, and they say, hey, if you come back tomorrow, we're gonna get we're gonna pay you again. Uh, what, or they say we'll pay you double for the exact same job, and like a third of the people didn't show up, even though they were going to now make twenty dollars an hour to dig a ditch and then fill it in. Because and then and then sure enough, the people who did show up, they're like, hey, come back tomorrow, we're going to pay you double. Now they're being paid forty dollars an hour to dig a ditch and fill it back in, and yet even more people stop showing up because there's no fulfillment in a job that you know is utterly pointless. So I, I would say that certainly. For you, it would matter to to recognize that temporarily, not long term, but temporarily, you are in a work environment that has removed some of your autonomy, which is going to make it difficult to to stay ahead of the curve emotionally. So you got to figure out how to fill that bank account with uh, with other things that you truly like about the job. I like the idea of thinking of this in kind of the, the monetary kind of way because it, it, there's something a little bit more concrete about that with feelings and emotions. It's not like like a video game where you have, to have these little bars. It'd be nice to be like, okay, here's your sanity bar, and here's your emotional bar, yeah. and here's other things. It's wonderful to have. I don't have that. That's that's uh, not I, even. And that's that's not even. I, I I don't think all that cartoonish. Uh, I, to be honest, that's the biggest thing that I'm thrilled about being able to podcast and stay at home is because I knew when I was on the road. Oftentimes, I would leave at my house at four o'clock in the morning to catch a six a.m. flight to fly. You know, and get a connection, get in somewhere around noon or one o'clock, drive an hour. Uh, uh, you know, get into the hotel, take a shower. And I had like two hours before I would have to go start setting up for the show. And I would be exhausted. I'd feel miserable. I'd, I'd be pouty. All of my energy bars would be low. And yet I would know that the whole reason I was there was so that I could be as positive and as enthusiastic and as jazzed and bring the best show possible to these people. And so what what I would do is I would, I would number one, I would, you know, I'd rest and then, and then I'd just eat junk food. So it's like at least my, you know, my health bar was going down as I shoved calories in my stupid face, but at least my temporary ego bar had gone up long enough to get me through the 90 minute show. And then I would be done and I would just be totally drained. All I'd want to do is go back to the hotel and, and, you know, drink beer and go to sleep. But, uh, but again, you know, I, as I get older, I'm realizing how untenable that is in the in the long term. So I'm glad to have a structure that allows me to keep all those bars a little more balanced and even. Do you think you've got a balance figured out yet? No, no, not not by a long shot. Um, the 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 best thing about being self-employed is also the most terrifying thing, which is you never tr you 
you never have true security. Now, now I believe that even when you're when you have a job for 30 years, you still don't have security. You only have the illusion of security. At least you think that you're entitled to your job and every day you show up. But the fact is they could fire you because some Japanese conglomerate bought the company and they need to downsize at any moment. Uh, when when you're when you're running your own business, you never know if what you're doing is right. You always assume you're making mistakes right and left. Every time you do something, uh, it's terrifying because you've invested your money, you've invested in your time, you've asked people to trust you, and you don't know if any of it's going to pay off. And and this to me is why it's so important to try to find peace in failure because I experience failure a lot, a lot. So I still have this perpetual low grade fear, but it does. I don't know. It doesn't sting. Like I failed so much that that, and and enough things have worked that you know I don't know. Barring a a stroke or a broken leg or whatever, uh, <laughs> knock on wood, uh, that uh, that I don't think there's much that can take everything away. And and with that reduction in immediate fear comes a, a, a modicum of peace. But but I I. I don't know what it would take for me to stop being scared all the time. I've spent like 15 years being terrified and thrilled, and I just wish there was a way for me to be thrilled without being terrified, but I haven't found it. I'm scared all the time. Let's speak about terrifying and scary things. Kids. Now, I've, uh, <laughs> one of the reasons why I got so set on this idea of figuring myself out and figuring out how to be peaceful and mentally calm is that if anything, I need to be able to explain this to somebody else at some point. I have a son. He's going to turn four next month. Uh, he's, he's obviously got the emotional maturity of a four-year-old. So I can relate to him really well. But as he gets older, <laughs> I can figure out how to, I can explain, okay, this is what your brain's doing. You're play, it's playing tricks on you. How have you, had, how, how have you found the experience of having children uh, up against this idea of trying to figure out yourself at the same time? Yeah, children are a shockingly accurate, uncomfortably accurate mirror of yourself. You know, there's uh, uh, our oldest would have difficulties where she would blow up and I would get so frustrated with her blowing up that I would blow up. And then Bonnie, of course, would point out like, look, where do you think she gets it from? And, and she's 100 percent right. And again, it's that it's that ego depletion thing. Uh, when, when you have kids, I guess that's the one problem is we talk about, you know, uh, taking deposits from one energy bar and throwing in the other. Kids are one of those obligations that you can't really cash out on. They're not one of those. They're, they're sort of like if they need their diaper changed, they need their diaper changed. And that's the end of it. You know, it's like there's no I don't care what else is on your plate. You're not going to you're not going to leave her in your diaper, you know. Yeah, it's like they, you don't have an ego when it comes to that. It's like, OK, you know what? I don't care how accomplished I've been or will be in the future. I have to do this. There's no choice. Absolutely. It's funny because Absolutely. we were talking about this of not having autonomy in your job and how that can be not satisfying. But the weird thing is with the kid, you lose any sense of ability to, you know, I can call the shots. There are, you are not the boss. And there's something, I don't, is that, is that, is that, I'm just realizing this now. Is that somewhat freeing that you don't uh, know I, what you, happen? I'll tell you what, and this is, I'll tell you who handles it great. You know, Bonnie handles it great uh, because, because lucky enough, you know, things are going well enough that she's able to play the full time mom. Uh, and I think that there's a consciousness and ownership of that decision where it's like my job is going to be to manage these babies and kids and get the house and and keep this stuff afloat. And, and she does it really well, uh, whereas every time she leaves, uh, I am suffering under the delusion that there's a chance, however small, that I can get something done while the 17 month old is walking around or, or if she would just stay quiet and asleep for just a little bit longer, I could get this email written or whatever. Uh, but it just makes it to where it's agonizing to me to, to see the work right in front of me, but, but not even physically be able to pick up the things because I've got the baby and the baby doesn't want to be set down on all these things. To me, it's very, very difficult. And I wish I could be as awesome as Bonnie is in that regard. And just, uh, I don't know. Just embrace the uh, the 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 warm cocooniness of uh, of being a parent during that time. But for me, seeing the chance to get important work done and not physically being able to do it is is agonizing. Yeah. So then there's a whole concept of setting up an example, being an example for them. Like you're saying that they notice everything you do, even when you think they're not looking. You're like, oh, they're asleep. They're not noticing anything. What's possible about that? Uh, 
does that, does that help? Does that motivate you at all? Because, I mean, you seem, again, like you seem like you're really driven. So if you've been trying to it's, improve and get better, does this help you know, or is this like, oh. Yes, it, it definitely does because now that, that Penny is 10 and I, and I start to see – all of all of my impatience, all of my blowing up, all of my you know running around doing other stuff, uh, last minute. I am now seeing reflected in Penny and uh, seeing somebody who very quickly. I mean, in the next what five years, Penny's not going to give a damn about what I say anymore. She'll be her own person in just five more years, which she hates hearing me say, but it's true. But uh, seeing how clearly early actions are reflected in later development of the kids, and seeing. That we have another kid, you know, what, nine years, uh, uh, Penny's junior, coming in, like, it gives me, I, I don't want to say, like, another chance, but an extended chance to make sure that at all times I am, to my kids, who I want to be. I want to be the guy who keeps promises, you know, who uh, who shows up on time, who notices when they're, uh, they're, they're, they're on task and off task. You know, those are all things I want to be, and uh, th I guess the good news is that it's not, you know, none of us are perfect, and and I, the, uh, none, none of us are perfect, but I'm thrilled to have a youngster that gives me more time to try to get closer to being there, if that answers your question. It, it kind of does. I mean, there's, like, there's never really a, a true answer. I guess when I want to ask you real quick before we wrap up, are there any things beyond exercise you do? Uh, to keep yourself calm or something that you think, listen, if I could tell somebody, this is the thing that keeps me centered. This is the thing that brings me back, gives me peace. What is that thing? I mean, it really is exercise. There was a time that, uh, that things got so busy and hectic and frustrating that I was wondering like, uh, oh man, am I, am I like depressed? Am I clinically depressed? And then, uh, and then I went out and exercised and, and I realized like, uh, it's not it's not a luxury to exercise for me. It's like I become functionally useless if I go more than two or three days without working out at all. And uh, uh, it's it's medicine. Like for me, that exercise really is medicine because uh, the movement there's the Zen moment of working out and being in the moment. Usually, I'm listening to an audiobook, uh, trying to learn something. There's knowing. At the end of the day, no matter what else happened, I did this for myself. And you feel it not just in your, you know, your mind, but, but, but literally in your body. You wake up the mor next morning and you feel the ache of your muscles and you know, that's right. Oh, that's right. I did something. You know, my, my happiness, I would say, is tied to the subjective feeling of how much ass I just kicked. And it's totally subjective. It doesn't matter if it actually, you know, even if even if all I did was clean out my inbox, like that can be that can keep me afloat for days. Um, and in that regard, uh, uh, working out is a way to get a chemical boost, you know, from whatever endorphins, but also a satisfaction boost boost uh, for for actually having completed a thing. So so for me. I would say as many times I try to pretend like it's otherwise, like, oh, I just love relaxing and playing video games. I think all of that is sort of emotional masturbation and that it leaves you at the moment thinking like, oh, look, I'm happy. But then but then it's over and you just feel empty inside. You're like, ah, man, I should have I could have actually done something that mattered. You know, that, that it's the idea of soreness. This, you know, after a workout, a good workout the next day, it almost seems like a forced mindfulness because normally we just take yeah. we just take. Oh yeah, I'm just sitting in a chair, and I'm just as you were saying this. I'm like, I'm realizing that's what it makes you do. You become very aware of how hard you worked the day before, and of how you physically are in the moment. And that's something that we talk about on the show a lot: mindfulness, this idea of being there in the present moment. A workout, you you got to be there, or you'll get you'll get injured. And the time after it, you're going to be sore. After you know, that. I wonder. I wonder if that's one of the benefits of yoga. If people really like that, uh, because you you do a good yoga thing, and you'll be freaking wicked sore for like a week. I wonder if if that's that desire to hunt down all every single tiny muscle and stretch it so that it'll be sore for a couple of days, so that you perpetually have that glow of having done something. I've done a bit of yoga when it comes to like P ninety X and P ninety X two yoga, and that thing you got to be really aware of how your body weight moves. So. You, it's almost like it's, it's a meditation in sorts. 
any exercises like that, especially, again, I can't say uh, enough about indoor rock climbing. It's the same kind of thing. If you don't know where your body weight's going, you're falling off. And that's yeah. fine. It's a great experience. Um, there, there is a, a real uh, uh, power to the sense of awareness. I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm sure you and I have talked about this. Like I'm really in, you know, my exercise nowadays is, is bike riding. And uh, especially now that, uh, you know, I got these, uh, the cleats, I actually am locked into the bike now, which means that you have to be hyper-focused, not only on what muscles you're using, because you, you could push down for a while. And when those muscles run out, because you're attached to the pedals, you could switch to muscles that are, that are moving up. And all of a sudden, it's like you have this new, new reserve. But it also, like you said, forced mindfulness. Because you're physically locked in, you lose the ability to stop on a dime. Because if you do, you're going to fall over and, and land on your ass. So you start to think always in 30 to 40 yards ahead, is there something that's going to make me possibly need to plant my feet down? And so you disengage your, uh, your cleats for all these things. Uh, I, li I like that idea of finding yourself in a situation where you're locked into a mindful state. No, I could yap with you for hours. I know you got engagements to go to. I know you got uh, meat to cook. That's not a euphemism. I do. You've got I'm going to find some care. inner peace by serving meat right now. Uh, but man, uh, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but we'll make it again again in the future. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would love to have you back if, uh, if you've got more stuff to say about this. Anyway, this is the weird part of the show, promotional stuff. Promote yourself. Oh, dude, uh, you know what? Check out Scam School or, or check out Cord Killers or check out – just follow me at Schwood. It's here. It's right there in the lower third right there. S-H-W-O-O-D. I do a pretty good job of letting you know whenever we're going live, uh, and occasionally I share funny stuff that I find. But, uh, uh, man, uh, don't worry about me. There's a, watch more Quest for Peace. That's what I say. We got this. And, of course, I've, I, and I know I might have said I had a rough week. A rough week. I love my job. I'm really excited. I get to move to New York. They're letting me do this. I get to work on the New York office of CNET. I'm really happy there. Uh, it's, I, I'm going to mention something. I'm going to mention this is going to be a much larger show at some point. But one of the things I have at CNET that I haven't had in a long time, respect. And you can't buy that. That's really great over there at CNET. So anyway, uh, I'm Isaac Trout. We do the show normally at 2 o'clock on Sundays on, on gfqlive.tv. If you couldn't catch it live, you couldn't join the chat room, we've got all the episodes available at gfqnetwork.com. You can subscribe uh, if you want. You can subscribe if you don't want. You could just choose to do wacky things. Uh, but let me know what you think. You can always follow me on Twitter at Iaz. Uh, you can send me emails, iazaktar at gmail.com. Maybe I'll get a gfqnetwork.com email address at some point. But that's pretty much it. Thank you, Brian Brushwood, for being on. And uh, everybody, good luck in being happy because you will fail, and it's okay because I, that's what I'm telling myself every single day. Yeah, peace and failure. Come on, man. Embrace it. It's going to happen anyway. Learn the lessons. <laughs>